Hello, it's Jen Top. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. This week, we have something different for our book club, the author herself. Poet Maggie Smith is here to talk about her Tell Most new best-selling memoir, You Could Make This Place Beautiful. You know Maggie from a poem she wrote in an Ohio coffee shop in 2015. That poem, Good Bones, was so deeply true and beautiful that readers passed it around and it went viral a year or two later. Poems don't go viral, but this one did, so much so that the unimaginable happened. First, in April of 2017, Meryl Streep read that poem, Good Bones, at a Lincoln Center gala. But there's a next. Next, her husband, the father of her two young children, the fellow writer, now lawyer, she had met in a creative writing class in college. That guy, he blew up the marriage with a pine cone and a postcard. Joining us in this conversation is one of Maggie's friends, activist and writer, Charlotte Clymer. You know Charlotte from her regular appearances on The Mary Trump Show. She was previously the press secretary for Rapid Response at the Human Rights Campaign and director of communications and strategy at Catholics for Choice. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. It's so great to see your faces all together on my on my non-Zoom, on my Riverside (laughs) screen. Um, So Maggie and Charlotte, I know you know each other, but I don't know how you know each other. So Maggie, do you want to tell me how you know Charlotte? Well, and we do and we don't. This is the, this is the world of the internet. So we've actually, (laughs) we've never been in the same place at the same time. I'm quite sure we're not the same person because here we are on Zoom (laughs) together. So now we have at least disproven that um but we not really i mean it was the magic of <laughs> of ai you could have you know what we're this. all part of one universe we're all connected right so. it's all very yes. confusing <laughs> um but yeah we met um we met on twitter mm-hmm. mm. yeah I, I was a fan of maggie's from afar for many years and we would occasionally interact with each other on twitter uh, and then that just kind of blossomed into a friendship, an online friendship, I should say. We still haven't hung out. No, we haven't. We need it's, to. We need to remedy this. That will yes. change, though. That will change. Okay. We can. Are you? We could all make a road trip to Ohio. Are you right now in Ohio, Maggie? I am. Yep, I am. And uh, Charlotte, almost always. <laughs> yeah, Charlotte, where are you? Uh, well, I'm based in D.C., but I'm actually staying with my uh, friend and my agent uh, at her uh, place in New York for a for a thing this week. So. Well, let me just ask you, when you say my friend and my agent, is it all one person or are these two people? Oh, all one person. Uh, okay. Lynn's jo- Lynn Jones Johnson. She's wonderful. And are you, are you doing a thing? You're in New York right now? hmm Oh, I'm headed to New York. I just oh, got cool. back. <laughs> Damn. Wow. You know, can we connect in person somehow? I know we don't have to use this time. This is a really, this is the book club. And we're all here. (laughs) We're supposed to be talking. But I feel like if this were a real book club, we would be doing this, right? And there might even be wine. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. It's social. So um, this is fantastic. I'll catch up with you separately on that. The Ohio (laughs) thing is, I don't know if you know this, Maggie, but I am a Michigander. Oh, I, I am from, although it's it very oddly, my whole family's from Michigan, but I happen to have been born in Tucson, which is like this weird sort of like what they, my parents are sort of passing through there. I mean, I don't mean like literally like <laughs> passing through and on the highway, my mother popped into Tucson general, but I kind of mean my father after medical school, they, I think he did his residency in Tucson and then there was the Vietnam war. And then my parents went back to Michigan, which is where from age two until 18, I lived in like right here. South, people South always Eastern. do. I, people always hold up their hands when you yeah. ask where the other in Michigan. Hand. Yes. Yeah. It's the, it's the, it's this hand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I actually, I taught last semester at the university of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And so I was Ooh. driving from Ohio to Michigan oh. one, one day a week to teach a grad a poetry seminar, staying overnight and then driving back the next day. Cause it's only three hours away. Right. But yeah, well, for we, an Ohio State person, that's like enemy territory. Oh, big time! <laughs> we called my parents called uh, called Ohio State Ohio Snake 
you know. Oh, uh, we wow. we call Ann Arbor the town up north. We're oh, not even allowed to see ouch. it. Ouch, that's harsh. Yeah, I know. Wait, so so did you stay overnight in Ann Arbor? Did they put you up or did you have to rent a yeah. place? Yep, they put me up there. Oh, how nice. I would have gone to University of Michigan if it had not been that my parents were such huge Michigan football fans. So every <laughs> home Saturday we had to we had to drive up and uh, to Ann Arbor and watch games. And when I was a young kid, maybe it was okay, but at some point, you know, I got into dance and theater. So, like, if you imagine me as a 12-year-old, imagine all black hoop earrings and smoking a cigarette. Like, that, and even deep down now, <laughs> like, I am not a smoker because it's really bad for you, but my real identity is that. And so I did not look right <laughs> at the at the football games, you know? No. <laughs> so I would have gone, and I, now I know. I mean, it took a while to understand that Ann Arbor wasn't just that 100,000-person 100, 100, stadium. Right. Yeah. Well, as someone who lives in Columbus, Ohio, it's yeah the same, although Columbus is a much bigger city than Ann Arbor. Um, but it's like a big football culture here that I, as a poet, do not quite fit in with. <laughs> and Charlotte, wh- where was your home? What is your home college football team? <laughs> oh, uh, the Texas it's Longhorns, the- hands oh. down. Yes, that's who I grew up watching. And, uh, you know, we have rivalries with everybody, uh, with Oklahoma Soup. Excuse me, with Oklahoma Sooners, with uh, Texas A&M. In the queer community, I guess I'm a little off the beaten path by being such a big college football fan. But honestly, a lot of queer people do love college football. Well, um, I mean, lesbians especially. Oh, lesbians especially. That's true. That is, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. That's um, why I was you know never what? very good at being, I wasn't, you know, I probably haven't outed myself because it's sort of big deal. But um, my ex-partner was a woman and... Although she was not really that much into sports, it was enough for me to understand that that was not, I am deep down, you know, if I have an internal identity, it is a gay male theater guy, you know, because <laughs> I am all about the show tunes and shoes, really. It's true. <laughs> well, Jim, I know it's a family, stereotype. So. Well, duh. I mean, okay. <laughs> but um, I guess, Can yeah. I just say, though, that I am so excited to hear y'all talk about this because this is going to be such a Gen X conversation and I am looking oh, forward yes. to that. Gen X. Oh, gosh, there was something that just came out in the New York Times about the different generations and how much money they had coming to them. And Gen X has nothing. We have nothing coming to us. No, nothing. No. But we have all the good memories of like, you know, MTV News, which I didn't even know was still on until Not the day when it died. No. Um, so but there's sad. so much more interesting stuff to talk about besides football. I don't even know how that even fucking happened. Um, <laughs> I think that's I really, my fault. <laughs> no, it's mine. It's just like Michigan brings me to the football and there's more. There's more. Because my mother, in fact, in college, when she met my father back in the, I guess it would have been very early 1960s, she was a theater person. And mm-hmm. I used to, when I was a kid, open the drawers and that she'd keep all of her mem- you know, memories of, of, you know, there'd be like watercolor stage sets and I wanted to act and dance and sing, but since I had no talent, that didn't happen for me. Oh, so I want to ask about perfume. I don't, I, I just, I saw that you love perfume and you, what I like about it is that you have different ones that you wear. Do you layer them too, Maggie, or just wear one at a time? Sometimes if I can't find one that has all that I want in it, mm. I will sometimes layer like, especially if I've got something that's kind of like smoky, I, mm. And I feel like something sweet, I might layer the two. But then I found one that has, like, for me, the perfect balance of both. So it's like the the two-in-one shampoo and conditioner of perfumes. Which is? For, um, it's called By the Fireplace. I'm writing this down. Ooh. And it's, uh, it's sort of, it's got smoke in it, which is my favorite smell. So speaking of smoking, I'm not a smoker, but smoke mm. <laughs> in general, like in a restaurant, at a campfire, in perfume, mm. in a cocktail, like mezcal, I love any kind of smokiness. Um, maybe from growing up with smokers, I have like a secondhand smoke nostalgia. Um, but yeah, that perfume is, it's sort of campfire meets like vanilla. So it's like a roasted marshmallow. (laughs) Okay. That's nice. I love it. I have two perfumes with me right now, but there was one, I can't remember. And I I need to look it up when I, a couple weeks ago, I went to the E. Jean Carroll trial and there was a reporter there, um, Lisa Rubin. There were a lot of reporters there. And she was, she's really lovely and fantastic. And she's so great that when I actually, 
I left. You're not going to believe this. I was reading a book about tax policy. So boring. And I had some hand lotion and I left them in the courtroom. And she, and then I had to call like whatever. And I'd already back home in Massachusetts. And I called the security guards and they found my book anyway. So she sent it to me, which was super nice. But she also had this perfume and I'm forgetting. I feel like it was called something cloud, but I've written it down. I've got to look it up because I would always know if she'd arrived that day Mm. in court because I could kind of, and it wasn't that it was overpowering. It was the most gentle of scents that would waft over to me and I would turn around and see she had arrived. But I am loving, do you ever wear Pure by Alfred Sung? No, but I love totally. a recommendation. Mm, wait, let me just spray it on. Yeah, but I sometimes, one of my favorites, and I, the reason why I got into this perfume is my mother has this thing. She goes to Key West every year and she invites um, friends out for what she calls the perfume brunch. All these friends at vacation, they have a timeshare there. And she has all these perfume samples and people test them out. And one of them, this is like my go-to favorite. It's called um, Love Kills Slowly. Oh. Do you know this? No. Oh, my God. Yeah, I just love it. And I don't know whether it's fruity or vanilla-y or citrus. I don't know. What as it far has. as that doesn't smell like smoke. Yeah, love <laughs> love kills slowly. It seems yeah. like it should have some sort of bitterness to it, and right? Hearty. right? Maybe I should send you, <laughs> as a thank you, different perfume samples, and then you could have these. I don't know how I, I can get, yeah, yeah, because I want you to know if these are good ones. Um but what are the, so I was wondering, you, you've already described it, that you like the smell of smoke. Are there other, is, is your olfactory sense your strongest one, do you think, or visual? Um, probably visual more, although I think, you know, there's evidence that smell is, mo- is the sense most tied to memory. Mm. And so mm. Proust, when, for example. yeah, right. Like when you smell, like for me, it's like pool chlorine. <sighs> Or freshly cut grass Mm -hmm. or certain like certain cooked foods that remind you of like your grandmother or something like there are those things or even like the plastic in some toys remind me of like a specific doll I (gasps) had, you know, like a doll face, that Mm -hmm. soft plastic, Mm -hmm. like a Barbie kind of smell. Um, I had a perfume that I put on the other day and I couldn't figure out why I liked it so much. And it's, I realized eventually it smells like PJ Rose's Barbie circa 1983. Oh. It's a rose perfume that smells exactly the way I remember my uh-huh. rose scented Barbie smelling I when I was six years old. <laughs> what's interesting to me is whenever I'm now realizing as you're describing this, that whether, whether it's called synesthesia or the you know, crossing of it, but then yep. often those, the smells that bring us back it's like more to our childhood, you know, as opposed to other periods of time. And it reminds me a little bit of the Maya Angelou um, thing that people, whether she said it or it's apocryphal, that people don't remember what you said, but they remember how you made them feel. And I think yeah. that's what fragrance is. Like I walked into an elevator and I don't even know, remember where it was. And it smelled like, like my elementary school, like a yes. cross between old wood and graham crackers. And it just... I was transported and I just wanted to, I just wanted to, it's like time travel. We don't usually get it. Like in a dream, you get it. Like if you're dreaming and you believe that that's really happening, you don't want to wake up and you do, that's kind mm-hmm. of what scent fragrance is or to me, I don't know. Charlotte, do I you- I think that's right. Do you wear, do you, are you into fragrance? I do like fragrance. Um, I tend to wear Chloe. It's soft and fragrant. It, it's not too overpowering. Down. Honestly, I'm, o- I'm always uh, afraid of overwhelming with scent, especially yes. perfume. So I like to go for more subtle uh, fragrances. I wish I were afraid. <laughs> Probably like <laughs> the, one, the one mistake I made is, oh my gosh, when I, how much do I tell? Okay, I'll just give this much. When I, mean, I, I wrote a memoir, <laughs> you can tell this story. No, 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 I don't. <laughs> when, uh, when I was in high school, I had a huge crush on my high school English teacher. It was well known. And his, not his <laughs> wife, because he was going through a divorce. I mean, not his second wife, but his soon to be third wife was my, before I even, well, anyway, she had been my ninth grade English teacher. And she had us read The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, which is a whole other interesting talk about foreshadowing, but we're not going to mm. go there. Anyhow, she apparently wore, my friend Joni knew the perfume well. She wore T. Rose perfume. So I decided I should, ick. have you ever smelled T. Rose? It's no. really strong. It's not, you don't want that perfume. It's overpowering. That. That's the only one that I think I would never, ever wear again. Okay. 
Um, so yeah. And then there's, I want to, I'm st- sticking on the fragrance, but what about coffee? You talk about coffee oh. a lot. Is, do you like the smell of coffee or do you just need the caffeine? Mm. Um, both. I like coffee as an experience. Like even if it's like a cold day and I've already had my like allotted one to two cups, I'll make decaf because I just like the hot mm-hmm. S- mm-hmm. and like the smell. There's something like ritualistic and comforting about it that I don't even quite get from tea or hot cocoa or some other drink. It has to be coffee. But coffee has a range. I mean, good coffee, coffee beans that you grind and you do the pour over or whatever you do have that. But bad coffee no, makes no me want to cry. That. Like bad coffee, like in the 1980s that was kind of getting burned in the, in your, in the office kitchen coffee. Yeah, no, that's not good. I mean, it's like, I feel like bad coffee is like bad sex. It just was, like reminds you of what you could mm, have if, if it were happening in a better way. It's yes, almost like, it's just totally. it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. <laughs> it should be actually illegal in every way. I agree. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so both of you, before we like, actually we can, I was going to ask about summer plans, but I just want to, so this is something unusual. Usually um, the podcast, you know, we have conversations one-on-one with an author or when, for the the book club, we get together and talk about a book, but not with the author. But I feel like you can talk. I mean, like you, the book isn't you, Maggie. I mean, you can talk about the or book. Or I can eavesdrop. Oh, I like that. So Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte. Did you, yeah. act, did you listen to Maggie on Audible or did you read or both? I read. Yeah, I didn't listen. Um, in fact, I hope I've, I've never read to an, I've never listened to an audio book ever. Yeah. For no reason. I have nothing against audiobooks. I just like the process of reading it physically. Yeah. I don't know why. I just do. With this um, book, it's but, two different books if you if you listen versus if you read. Like I was kind of... Really? Well, because I was walking around... Because like, I sometimes I have to do things like clean the house or get exercise, you know, so <laughs> I will... Um, or knit. I sometimes have to knit because I'm anxious. So having a book in my ears is helpful. But I really like the physicality of a book and I want to mark mm. things in the margins. Mm. So I would do like listen for an hour and then I'd flip through the pages and then, you know, put the, and mark the page I was on and, and things. But what I noticed about Maggie's book is if you read it there, it you wouldn't have known if you listened how many, I don't even want to call them chapters, but they're these little, they're chapters, vignettes. but they're like vignettes. That, they're like they, vignettes. They, yeah. But, um, because when she reads it out loud, she reads in each vignette will have like a title, but she just reads it through, like straight through, like sung through, like a musical. And then you don't really realize, I think going back and seeing how it was constructed was really interesting too. Like I, I, I you know, I'd be happy to share my audible with you, Charlotte. Also, you get to hear Maggie's voice. Oh, yeah. And I didn't yet see on the page, like sometimes she says these things like, was and then she'll say is because she's still going you know going through it so it's a bit of a different okay so now that I know how you read it um what do you what do you what are the both sort of as a reader your impressions and then maybe as someone who's a writer I know you now have an agent what you want to ask about or what you think about the writing in terms of the writing structure as opposed to the reading impression of it okay um well gosh let me back up as a writer and as a reader, as a writer, excuse me, as a reader, um, I read all kinds of books, right? So they just span everything. I love memoirs. I love historical fiction. And I love, you know, all sorts of nonfiction. Um, but what I loved about Maggie's book, especially was that the structure made it so easy to read for those who are busy or going about their day. I can read two or three vignettes and then go back to what I was doing. And as a person with ADHD is specifically, that's so, that's so convenient. (laughs) It really Mm -hmm. is. I can process it very quickly and just build upon it with something like, let's say Doris Kearns Goodwin or Robert Caro, you know, you have these big meaty biographies and it feels like you're, you do a 40 page chapter and you're just kind of marching (laughs) through it and trying your best just to get through the, the damn chapter, which takes like 45 minutes. So the structure was so good. And here's what I love most about it. It didn't sacrifice any quality at all. Everything is so Sorry, well. Down. It sounded like you just said oh. it didn't sacrifice any quality, but you mean you said any quality, yeah? It didn't sacrifice anything at all. It okay. didn't sacrifice any quality. It was so well strung together, and I felt like the way that it kept returning 
to things, you know, like this is a note on the title page. This is a note on, you know, this or that. Um, it, it had this really lovely way of putting together interludes and making them as, as almost like, um, I don't know how to put it, almost like a, uh, uh, an accent theme all mm-hmm. throughout the memoir. Maybe I'm overreading into that, but... No, I mean, I it, thought I liked I how it was that. recursive and there were certain motifs and metaphors that repeated, yes. but then like a little bit different the second time. Maggie, yeah, you're exactly. nodding your what head. You? Should we should we talk? <laughs> let you talk or not? This is like a creative writing workshop where your story or poem is being workshopped and, and you have to stay quiet and people are talking about it. And then someone will say like... Maybe I'm wrong, but like, I feel like this character is really like this guy or something. And you're sitting there and you're biting your tongue and you want to say, yes, that's exactly it. Or like, no, that's not it at all. The workshop (laughs) experience. Um, No, that's 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 wonderful. I mean, I definitely built a lot of repetition and return into this book because I think the the primary sort of like emotional weather or sort of psychological weather of the experience that I'm writing about or experiences is rumination, Mm -hmm. which is like, I can't stop thinking about and sort of chewing on these things because I don't quite understand them. And so to tell the tale, I, I kind of picture the shape as being a corkscrew because I'm moving forward in time, but I'm moving forward in time in a way that's sort of like, and there's that thing again. Up, mm. And there's that thought again. Mm. And there's that thought again that I can't quite let go of. So those resurfacings um, are definitely there. And I, I'm interested in, in the idea of the book being different. Listen to versus read. Mm. That was my impression when I left the studio after recording, you know, five hours a day, three days in a oh row, the audio book, um, which was like, wow, kind of stings, you know, reading all of this out loud. But um, I I wondered about that because white space is so important in this book mm-hmm. and the amount of white space, you can't just pause to indicate a longer white space in, because people will be like, is it, is my machine broken? Is this thing stopped? Did I pause it? Where did she go? You mm-hmm. have to keep going after a pause. So a pause between paragraphs and a pause between pages sound the same, but visually you can see that's a one sentence chapter and you get a whole page of white space. That is processing space for you, the reader, to sit mm-hmm. with the kind of heavy thing that I've just handed you, and I but can't do that audibly. On balance, though, and and I miss that. That's, that was why it was so nice to go back and go, oh, wow, that was a page that yeah. hits me differently. It, the power of the blank page, the, where the breaks happen, tell us a lot emotionally. But I would also say there are certain words that repeat that are, are words that are not unusual enough that I think that only by hearing you read it did Mm. I tie different things together. And um, one of the things is, and I, and I, I, I imagine, I mean, you're a poet, you would realize this, but sometimes this stuff can be unconscious. The different uses of the word material. Yeah. Oh, you know. That was intentional. Oh, I thought so. Because at one point (laughs) I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, there, and there are, um, there are different, I mean, to me, as a reader, it's hard to, you know, half of me, I sometimes tell people that like half of me is human and half is lawyer, but, but why that I mean is half of me, I, mean, I have a problem, like I think like the corpus callosum, like I really do think half of me experiences things very emotionally and the other half is entirely analytical and they don't often talk to each other. And I think that's why mm. I try to write so I can communicate with these two sides. Um, and so when I when I think about your book, you know, I'm enjoying it. And then when I started sort of taking notes, I start like becoming like I'm an English major writing an essay about the use of the word, whatever, you know what I mean? Or like, <laughs> but so, but for me, one of the places where I think spoke to me so much, and I guess, you know, folks know generally uh, what the, the the book is about. I, like you're saying, it's kind of um, returning to, and what is the word you just use? Ruminating, you know, ruminating and chewing and revisiting 
um, this experience that began, I guess, when you when you learn that your ex husband was having an affair. That's the beginning, and that's I think people would would already know that. It's not so much so much of a spoiler, but there was something. I mean, there are things that that what makes I think everything so beautiful here is the contrast between things that feel so ethereal, but the way the mundane can take on weight. And there's mm-hmm. this thing throughout um, this moment when you notice, on, and I'm going to ask you to talk about this and how it repeats, on Google Maps, you see your house and and the way Google, seeing your house at a period of time at first, how it feels and later Google Maps is a kind of witness to your development. Can you talk a little bit about about that experience? Yeah, I wrote I wrote that essay that ended up appearing in um, the Modern Love um, column of the Times, and I wrote it about a month after my ex husband moved out of our house, and I was I was actually in speaking of Tucson, I was in Tucson. Um, as a poet in residence at the university there. And for some reason, I thought to Google my address. Like, I think I was homesick. <laughs> and like, You don't well, need a I, good reason to Google your own address, trust why? me. Why? I mean, it, but it is sort oh, of an odd, gosh. it's an odd impulse. I don't <laughs> know why I did it, but I Googled my address and then <laughs> looked at, and you can click through, right? All of these, t- you know, talk about time travel, you can click mm-hmm. through all of the sort of past, I don't know, five or six images that the car driving by with the camera. I didn't know that until I read your book. I thought there was only one static image. No. Yeah. If you look and then you can click back and and then as they update, the oldest ones fall off. And so I realized it, it's mm-hmm. something about being able to intuit things about what are what's going on inside the house based on the date, season, and what... I see outside. So I could see like my son's stroller and I can look at the date and I can think, okay, well, that was when he was like two. So he's probably napping or we were playing or maybe we we were back from library story time. But ultimately, I think the overarching metaphor is that no one really knows what's going on inside a house. And that looking at the surface images of your house give you some clues but they don't really tell the story of what's going on inside. Even we don't know what's going on inside of our own homes. And oftentimes we don't even know what's going inside our own homes. And so there's this sort of like, um, there's like a mystery aspect mm-hmm. to it too. And and the mystery is your life. <laughs> and it's unsolvable. Spoiler alert. The mystery of your life is largely unsolvable, despite the ruminations, you know. <laughs> uh, and the houses, I mean, so there's that right here I go, but houses and how they get, a house, how it gets figured in here. You know, when you choose this house, and I love the way you describe the color as being, what is the color from the crayon box you said it periwinkle. was? Periwinkle. Periwinkle. Yeah, that's my and favorite the, cr- crayon. But there's also the other, I mean, your son draws for school the family and there's two different families and there's like mm-hmm. two different, I just think about these different houses. And to me, I can't imagine, well, I can't imagine a parent moving out of state at the beginning of COVID just so he could be with his sweetheart who has her own children and leaves where his children are. I mean, it's, um, but it's it was done, and you're, you're not the only house where that happened. But yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm struck by. I was reading the interview with you with NPR from last month, and they asked you. The reporter asked you, "Has your ex read the book?" And and not only, I mean, you don't know, and you've not, and he's not commented, and, um. I mean, is it, I know you're not an omniscient narrator and the one doesn't exist, but you both were in that uh, advanced writing workshop together. How much is this deep envy? Or Who you knows? Know? Yeah, I don't. I mean, the, the tricky thing about memoir, I mean, and the tricky thing about life, I suppose, is like you only know what's going on inside your head and sometimes not even that, which is why we have therapy. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's like if the body is house, right? Like sometimes we don't know what's going on in there, even if it's ours. (laughs) 
Yeah. That's, you know, we are largely mysterious to ourselves, but certainly other people are mysterious to us. And so part of the project for me of writing memoir was not allowing myself to project into guess, suppose, or otherwise ventriloquize as if through a doll what mm-hmm. anyone else might have been thinking or feeling. I only know sort of what was said to me and and what, you know, quote unquote happened. Mm-hmm. But I really don't know the rest. And when you don't have a, a sort of communicative relationship with another person, you you really don't know. And even when you do, you might not know because there's what we say to others and what we think. And they're not always aligned. And there's what we think and what really happened. I mean, in, until you mm-hmm. evolve or mature. The older I get, the more I go back and relive or revisit those really hard moments or relationships or things. And I think differently about my role in it, you know, yeah, sort of like that object permanence thing. The younger you are, you just, I think there's a period of my life where I thought if I was just in a room looking and watching people that I wasn't impacting, there was no change, you know, Heisenberg stuff, uh, but I didn't believe in it. And now I understand you're always affecting the yep. behavior and you don't know what happened before you came into the room or after. And um, Charlotte, what are the, I mentioned that one motif, what are the other, because you did talk about these different um, kind of motifs in the recursive aspect. Are there things that metaphors or images that, that stay with you or poems in the book? Well, foreshadowing. I mean, ah, um, yeah. you know, wanting and which is what y'all were just talking about. Um, th- there was a really great part that stuck with me because I thought about this so much, Maggie. But the way you put it kind of finally put the pieces together in my head. I don't know. It seems so simple, but sometimes it's not when we're in our own heads and trying to think about this. And here's how you wrote it. You said it's a mistake to think of one's life as a plot, to think of the events of one's life as events in a story. It's a mistake. And yet there's foreshadowing everywhere foreshadowing I would have seen myself if I'd been watching a play or reading a novel, not living a life. And that is so completely true. And it's infuriating to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hard same. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, my goodness. And tell me it's why tough. though, Charlotte, what? I mean, are, there, are you looking back on, is it, did that resonate because there were certain moments when you made what you perceived to be mistakes or could have taken a different path and you didn't because you just put blinders on? Is that what you're talking about? All the time. But also, I just think that we're too hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And and especially those of us who do write about our lives, we're especially hard on ourselves. We're always unpacking these parts of our story that seem a lot simpler to have navigated when we're writing about them. But honestly, they weren't so simple back when we were going through them. And we didn't have all of the, uh, we didn't have the 360 view. We didn't have the wisdom that we do now. And that's that's hard to remember, um, especially when we're trying to reconstruct those moments for other people. Mm-hmm. And, and you do it so well, Maggie. I mean, you do that yeah. so well. And and what I especially loved about it, this book generally, is that you know I'm I'm terrified of writing about family. I really am. I don't write about family very often uh, because I always wonder: Am I being generous enough? If I am I am I being too harsh? Um, am I doing this the justice that everybody deserves, not just me? And so, you know, I think I'm far away from that moment where I'm going to be able to write about family. And yet the way that you go about this, Maggie, is that I don't know if you felt this as you were writing, but you you walk such a precise tightrope between generosity and honesty. Mm. And all of it comes across as very rational and honest and, and I would say even kind toward everybody involved. Maybe kinder than some folks deserved. <laughs> Um, but you do it so well. And I wish that I could emulate this kind of approach to writing about loved ones or people who are in our lives. Oh, thank you. It's hard. I mean, I think I hear all the time, like I have so many stories I want to tell. I hear this from students or at Q and A's. I have so many stories I want to tell, but I have to wait till everyone's gone. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think I feel comfortable writing about my mother, my father, my grandmother, my sister, my ex, my, you know, my children. I mean, whoever these people are, my neighbor, my, my nosy neighbor, you know, whatever it is. And I, and I get it. And there probably are some stories that really need to sort of like not be told necessarily while someone is, is walking the earth. 
Mm. But for me, I mean, I just kept telling myself, stay in your lane. And my lane is, is that I can only tell what I experienced, which doesn't make it the capital T truth. Mm-hmm. And that maybe is something that poetry set me up really well for. I'm really mm. comfortable with the gray, super comfortable with ambiguity, very comfortable with holding two unlike things at the same time and having them weigh basically the same in my hands. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the idea of of just staying in my lane, staying really grounded in my own experience and saying like, these are the facts as I know them, which are objective. Like these things actually happened and are provable, but there's not really an objective truth to be offered here because everyone would describe these objective facts differently and they're colored by these different places that we're all coming from. So if I'm telling you my story only and not giving it sort of primacy as the story, that was what made me comfortable enough to do it. But it's still scary because I you know, I'm at my core, like a Midwestern mom. And I want to be, I mean, there's a real sort of deep and like probably deeply needing to be shed desire to be liked and thought of as a quote, good person, Mm. (laughs) which I do think is also very gendered. Um, In addition to being regionally (laughs) um, important. And so Like, what does that mean? And how do you tell the truth about your life? What I like, though, is there's this moment in the book where you make that clear without saying those words. I mean, you let us understand that this is only through your eyes. And I thought that moment when you were finally, you're describing when you had finally told your mother about the divorce And she said to you, she said, oh, do you remember when your ex had uh, on your 40th birthday, is this, if I remember this right, written Mm -hmm. written out 40 things he loved about you and you hadn't remembered. (laughs) And I'm laughing because you put that in there, but it's so great because it just, it just lays there, right? It just, Mm -hmm. there that is. Um, And that's, that says something. You know, were you not able to receive that? Had you already checked out? Um, why that? Why did that disappear? And that immediate clu- immediately clues us into you. Just you know, even you are only remembering and reflecting on the things that seem vital to you in this particular this version of the story of the relationship. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a machine. I mean, I don't actually remember everything. Luckily, I have social media and notebooks and other people to help fill in the gaps. Mm-hmm. But I'm, you know, I'm a sieve like we all are. So things are just passing through. And we'd like to think, I think, that the important things are large enough not to fall through like the small holes and get filtered out. But I don't think that's necessarily true. I think we forget big, beautiful things all the time. Mm. And it's mercifully, like, you know, big, painful things all the time. <laughs> remember those annoying, maybe this is like a Gen X thing, but those annoying, um, those things you buy at the supermarket, it was like on a cardboard, had a plastic over it. It had like a man's face drawn on it and had the iron filaments. And wherever oh, if you yeah. shook it, wherever the magnets were, the filaments oh. would attach. And I sort of think that's a little bit about how we accumulate memories. I mean, once you have this sort of story, you've been telling yourself the thing, only things that are going to kind of grab on so it's just going to keep grabbing onto the same place where that pattern is. If you don't, if you don't, you're not going to attract something maybe outside it, unless it mm. really is shocking, right? Unless yeah. you really get, um, really get thrown off course. There's this thing you also say, which, um, I mean, there's so much, you know, it's interesting. I, I hate even like pointing to one thing or another, because I think readers will find all of this so rich, but uh, he, here's one you wrote about, Um, identity, you said, how I picture it. We are all nesting dolls carrying the earlier iterations of ourselves inside. We carry the past inside us. We take ourselves, all of ourselves, wherever we go. Don't we? (laughs) I mean, we do, but I'm asking you now as a writer, 
Were you staring at some nesting dolls? I mean, what is the moment? And then do you write this, like, do you take notes in the back of your iPhone? Or are you like scribbling on en- backs of envelopes? Like <laughs> I do? Like where are these, when, when it goes, I think I've got something, where does that land mm. for you? How do you accumulate? Well, the nesting dolls image came to me like 20 years ago. And I wrote a poem about it. Um, and that's, it's just sort of been living with me for a Um, long time. And I, mm -hmm. I have like kind of a nesting dolls thing. Like my kids, one of my kids collects them and, and I, I love that the idea of it's, it's sort of like the other image that I think about a lot is, is when we save drafts of something, there was always this option, I think in like the old word or maybe word perfect where you could like save over, right? Like you would just save the new one. It would just replace it was like save, replace. It would replace the old version. Right. So if you make a change to a poem or an essay or something, it just saves over and you lose the old version. And I don't think that that's how people work. Like, I think as we evolve and change, most of those changes are tiny and incremental anyway. And we're, I think we keep all the versions. Like, I still feel really in touch with childhood me, and teenage me and 20 something me. And I don't feel like the version of the person I am now has replaced any of those people. You know, my dear grandmother, Grandma Lillian, my father's mother would say when I was growing up, you know, when I was a young adult, when she looked at me, she didn't just see me, she saw the child. And she said, you'll know this when it happens. And I have a younger brother who's 10 years younger. And when I see him, I see the baby when I'm staring Mm -hmm. at him. Like I see all the dolls right there. So, but I've never thought of myself as kind of containing those. I mean, I feel like, you know, I kept, before there was Twitter and you could just write your thoughts out to the world, I kept journals, <laughs> you know, since I was, you know, uh, I think it was 14 years old. And they're like, I'm pointing over that way, but they're over wherever they're on the, on the shelf. And, um, you know, when I was younger, I would reread just so I would never forget who that person was. And then <laughs> now that I'm 56, I went back to read this stuff just out of college with my older daughter's age. And I'm reading it out loud and I'm like, what an unbearably pretentious <laughs> asshole I was at the time. And then I'm thinking, maybe I still am. But no, I think I'm hoping that that, that doll is, you know, deep inside somewhere wearing the leather jacket and smoking a cigarette, you know? I mean, I can, <laughs> but that would be a fun exercise to have to customize these Matryoshka dolls, right? With different versions of yourself. Oh my gosh, I love that. My my high school one would, would definitely <laughs> be wearing black and maybe Doc Martens and perhaps have a clove cigarette. That's that would be my very like <laughs> early 90s. Um, yeah, I write on notebooks. Um, I write in my phone. I write on really any, yeah, same, any scrap of paper I happen to have around. <laughs> right, right. Um, backs of receipts. I mean, really anything that I can get my hands on. And, and thankfully for smartphones, like I now oh. just have something I can write yep. or talk um, into if I'm same. driving. Right. Um, but And but, then I lose them. Right. <laughs> What's what does it ever happen to you in your writing process where like you're like oh my gosh oh my gosh and then you either like write it on the scrap or you put it in the phone and then later you find out you've written that like six times before like you (laughs) the revelation so you don't really lose the core things maybe I think most of the core things stick around or find a way to come out in some other maybe the phrasing is lost, but the idea usually finds a way to keep knocking until you open the door. You talk a lot and are honest about depression in this book, you know, postpartum depression, also the situational depression of a family, you know, falling apart. And you write this, uh, I want to cut a hole in the air and climb inside. How, and you talk about tapering off an um, (laughs) anti-anxiety med. I don't know if you fully tapered off or if you decided because of the panic attack in the hotel room, I think in Los Angeles, not Mm -hmm. to, but I I did. (laughs) And so what do you do now um, with your nervous energy or your anxiety and stuff? Right? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm totally unmedicated now. Um, I, writing helps. I feel, um, I feel much better than I did five years, you know, four or five years ago, Um, which is, I mean, thank goodness. Mm. If I didn't, I would still be medicated um, because it worked when I needed it. 
You need to be bathed in the serotonin because you had none left. Yes. I just, I was like very, very depleted. Um, but I, I find, um, that somehow naturally I feel well enough on my own now, if I get enough fresh air and sunshine and time with my children, that even during the really stressful times, I might be cranky. Um, and I'm not, I'm not a great sleeper, which is not great for, for stressful times. Um, but I haven't felt that just make it stop feeling that I had when I wrote that sentence. Oh, so much pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Charlotte, so back to you as someone who's, who's, who is a writer and I sounds like you're going to be working on a new project. Do you have, um, oh, before I get to you, I'm sorry. I want to say this thing, which is, um, you describe yourself when we're talking now, Maggie, in, in different ways, like, um, well, you know, I'm a mom, you know, I'm this and that. And it reminds me of, um, Mary Carr, of course, mm-hmm. you must have read Liars Club. And mm-hmm. in some interview, I'll never forget that. I, mean, I must have heard it on NPR, like before we could just like Google and, uh, you know, maybe she was on Terry Gross, but this way that, you know, for her kid, you know, being famous, you know, that wasn't the thing for her kids. They just wanted to make sure like the pancakes were on the table. Um, and you, I think you you wrestle with this a little bit in the book. I think there's a bit on page uh, page 71 um, and I love what you said here. Uh, Meryl Streep can read your poem and it can be in an episode of primetime, t- a primetime TV show, but your life is still your life, mothering and dog walking and working. The things we call life changing are and aren't. Mm-hmm. I like that you're not denying that a poem going viral will change your life, but also that that's not really your life, so to speak. Can you talk about that experience of because of writing this poem and then the reaction and how you manage the attention? Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote the poem really quickly at a coffee shop in my neighborhood in 2015. And Sorry, then, the poem I'm referring to since you've written so many is oh. <laughs> Good Bones. <laughs> I, thank you for saying that, actually, because sometimes people will come up to me and say, I love your poem. And I think I've written thousands of them, but I know the one they mean. I know the one they mean. The Bride, that's another one. Yeah, uh, yeah. So so Good Bones came pretty quickly. I wrote it in 2015. My kids were little. And then it was published because this is the way publishing works, right? You send out work and then it ends up getting slated for publication later. So it was published in June of... 2016, the same week as the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando Uh, and the murder of um, MP Joe Cox in England. And so the poem went viral um, in both places for two different reasons, because it was just a week when a lot of just incredibly terrible, violent things Mm. happened. And it was like lightning hit my life. It was so strange. I mean, I I think my kids at the time were, you know, three and six. And um, in like, you know, kindergarten and like part-time preschool. And I live in Columbus, Ohio, mm-hmm. and I'm self-employed and I'm just like editing and, and teaching. And I just, I have a very, a very regular life in which you don't expect to get a call from the BBC when you're like at library story time. Um, And so it was life changing. Wow, really? Yeah. I mean, it's, it was life changing in that suddenly my readership widened like overnight exponentially. And, Mm -hmm. and for a poet particularly, like, you know, mm. poetry has a, a pretty small discerning audience, but f- to sort of jump outside of the normal, regular poetry readership to um, to have like actors, you know, sharing the poem and musicians and people who I was just like, oh, I know who that person is and politicians. And it was just incredibly strange. And yet the texture of my daily life didn't change at all. All right. the same responsibilities, all the same. I mean, I'm nothing sort of materially really changed. It's just, um, 
a lot more people knew who I was. But then, I mean, to some degree, was it that experience that gave you the book deal that allowed you to stay in your home? No, actually, no. Oh. Um, that was that was much later. So okay. um, oh, that was right, because, that was for okay. keep moving. Yeah, okay. that was for the book Keep Moving, and the advance for that book is what allowed me not to lose my house in the divorce. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, all of these things sort of it's you know building a building a career as a writer is sort of nothing really happens overnight. It's still kind of a long a long game. Um, and so yes, it, it was life changing, and and it wasn't. And, you know, my kids, obviously, like, they know that happened. Um, they have read the poem. They have heard me read the poem. But again, like, you know, like Mary Carr and the pancakes, I'm just their mom. <laughs> they want to know that, that I'm here when they get home from school. They are, you know, slightly mm. annoyed when I have to travel for, you know, book tour. Mm -hmm. They're much happier when I'm here. And to me, I'm just, you know, to everyone else, I might be the writer, but to them, I'm just their mom with a terrible sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlotte, um, you are someone who's who who writes and has been an advocate, but you're working on something new. Can you speak for yourself and maybe other listeners with questions about the writing process or whatever you want to ask Maggie from at all, really? Yeah, you know, I think it goes back to, um, well, and by the way, you know, I really think of Maggie as a writer that I want to emulate down the road. Um, I feel like, you know, I when I read Good Bones specifically, and I, I'm sorry to keep going back to Good Bones, but it's just, it's, right. it's just such a fucking great poem. It oh, just is. Thank you. I <laughs> love is. when it's, you share that superb. poem. Please. I, I love it. Thank you. Do you know what? Can I just, sorry, I'm cutting you off, but the first time I read your poem was probably a year after. It might not have been until Trump was in office and Dahlia Lithwick shared it. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead, Charlotte. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. It's just, you know, I read something like that and I'm like, if I work really hard at improving my own writing, this is something I may be able to write in 10 to 15 years from now. So that's kind of the relationship I feel like I have with your writing style, Maggie. Oh my goodness. Um, it just, there's, there's certain things about it. It's not pretentious. It's very direct. It's accessible. And it doesn't try to do anything more than just tell the truth, mm. which which I love about it. Uh, How the, about the, the humor book, too? <laughs> the and the humor. humor. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 dark and it's funny, but it's mm -hmm. also uh, it's also comforting. It's like a hug from someone who knows how to put out a zinger. You know, <laughs> it's so good. Um, and the memoir I'm working on right now is very similar in how I try to approach some really shitty things that happen to us, that happen to all of us, but how to write about that honestly. And, and you know, Maggie, specifically with this book, the way you approach, I guess, and how do I put this, how do, how do I put this in a kind way? How you approach people who've harmed you mm -hmm. or, or caused you pain. How do we do that? And how do we do that while also recognizing their humanity? Mm -hmm. And that can be really hard to do because I don't want to be unjust to them, but I also want to be just to my own story and to my honesty and to how it made me feel. And I, I guess I would ask you, were there moments when you were writing this when you thought, oh, you know what, I'm going to take that out? Or, you know, you went back and you said, actually, no, I'm going to put that back in because that's true. And even if that person doesn't happen to like that, maybe this is something that needs to be said anyway. Both. I mean, first of all, thank you. That's so kind. Both things happened. I mean, I um, I think first drafts happen for a reason. You know, you kind of like dump everything in there and then the sort of culling mm. begins. Um, and I will say most of the culling was more about protecting my kids' inner lives than, than anyone else in, mm -hmm. in the book. Like, I really didn't want their too much of their feelings or perspective to be in the book. You know, it's like, again, staying in my lane, like if they ever want to write about this time in their lives, they will get to do that later. And I don't want to tell anything that's sort of like their story to tell. So that, that was really the most sort of protective impulse I had. Um, but I also didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to read or write an angry book. Mm. 
Like it, it didn't, it, it's like, I didn't want to write anything that lacked nuance, nor do I want to read something that lacks nuance. Um, and so that was kind of my, my guiding thing. Like if I'm, if I want peace in my life, if I want to lead with sort of empathy and understanding, but also tell the truth, that's that those are going to be the scales for me. And how do I hold all of those things? Sometimes when I'm writing something, I especially something personal, like an essay that I know is going to be published, I, I kind of ask this very central question, how much pain is this going to heal versus mm. how much pain is this going to cause? And I'm and maybe, you know, maybe I'm thinking of this completely wrong, but is that sometimes how you approach it? Um, I love that you ask that question because it's it's it might be how much or it might be for how many people like this. Will mm. this be painful for one person, but will it help a hundred thousand? Wow! Like, is it a greater good question? Um, will this be painful for me to have people read it? But will it possibly be healing or transformative mm. to a lot of other people? In which case, I'll take the heat yeah. um, or embarrassment or or whatever that is. For me, I, it's sort of like, what's the tipping point of, of like, I'm scared to say this and I don't want to do it, but also I feel like there's value mm. in doing it. And, and can I keep the value without doing harm? Like, how do I, how much can I take away to ease the potential harm, but still keep the core truth and most of the sort of value that some other reader will get from that experience. And it's a lot of like taking one pebble off of a pile and moving it and then just sort of stepping back and being like, okay, yeah, I actually took, I took some of the teeth out of that, but it mm -hmm. still does the same work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And in some ways taking some of that and some of the detail creates it a more universal, uh, you know, description that maybe even more people can relate to, too. So yeah, it's not necessarily it can. limiting. It can. Although I'm more and more surprised by the stickiest parts of any story are always the things that could have only happened to one person. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, uh, people will say, oh, that conversation you had with your son, it definitely didn't happen with anyone else and their son. Like it was a very specific conversation. And someone will say, I related so much to that. It's not because they've had that conversation, but um, I do think that it's, this sort of counterintuitive thing that the stickiest things that have the most hooks in it for other people to attach to are actually the things that are hyper particular and specific. Speaking of which, even though I was saying that wasn't the case, you are entirely right because one thing that still sticks with me, and let me give it some context as we start winding down, is I usually read the acknowledgments of a book first, and yours mm. was the exception. Mm. Um, and the thing is, when I read, I do that because I'm typically reading um, works of nonfiction that are either um, polemics or they're historical accounts or they're from lawyers who don't. Um, always reveal themselves. And so if I see themselves peeking through, I want to ask about that. But often I've got to go to the acknowledgements to see that. But with you, it's kind of inside out. And mm -hmm. that you acknowledge your friends, your mentors, your parents, everyone early and often and throughout. And I think for me, um, incredibly relatable. Obviously this didn't happen to me, but I feel like it did. Um, in, the, in the vignette called Second Christmas, you write about a, a neighbor from like the block over named Taylor who, who peers on your porch, and I'm going to read this part, holding her young daughter, a toddler with bright red curls. She held out a paper plate to me covered in foil. And then a little bit later, I took the plate and thanked her and tried to keep myself from crying until after I closed the door behind me. Then I stood at my kitchen counter, making a very strong pour over, eating orange cake with my hands. Mm. <laughs> I can feel that. And I want to ask you, I mean, you, um, I, I won't even ask you more about it, but I'll say part of what they made so poignant is that she'd come to you and said, I remember that first holiday alone without my son. And that we don't need to even know anything more than to know what empathy that was. And she is just one of the many people, many women mostly, who are like this net around you. And I wanted to ask you, 
about that and how, how you maintain those really important friendships? That honestly has been the sort of saving grace for me is, is my community. I mean, I'm, I'm in the same house that I've been in for 13 years in the same neighborhood. I am in the same greater city area that I've been in my entire life. So 46 years I've lived here. And so I don't have to travel very far. <laughs> to, I can walk a block in either direction and, and arrive on the porch of someone who's known me for 20 years. Mm. Um, and like, you know, pre-good bones, pre-children, pre, pre-marriage, um, mm. I can walk to people's houses who knew like someone I dated in college, you know? And so there's this, like, I have dinner with my I'm parents. I'm watching Charlotte's face, and I see that, on the one <laughs> hand, you have a very loving background, but for some people... It would be terrifying. like suffocation. Am I right? Am I reading that right? Or? Oh, no, I not to interrupt, because that was, sorry, that sorry, was really I didn't wonderful. Mean, but I think that's... Be- no, I'm, I didn't mean to take something beautiful and turn and turn it in a different <laughs> direction, but I'm watching your face, Charlotte. Oh, no, it, it, makes, me, it makes me emotional. I mean, yeah. just to think about, you know... We all had lives before we became public figures. You know, we all had friendships and um, relationships. And, you know, for you, Maggie, you have this, uh, you have this community. And continuity. continuity. Yeah. Continuity, especially. And I think that all of us who are, I don't know, maybe a little bit broken in some places are searching for that kind of sense of continuity. It's such a blessing to have. It's, you know. it's been, it's been huge. It's been huge. And for my kids too, like mm. to have this much upheaval and to be able to have this kind of continuity has been, um, it's been everything. Cause it's, I mean, what do we really want? Isn't it to be like known, like truly known and seen exactly mm. as we are? So we are sadly coming to the end and I'm going to ask something and I know you've been asked it, Maggie, a million times, but would you, for Charlotte and I, read (laughs) Good Bones to us? I will. I love it. It's story time. (laughs) I love it. Yes, of course I will. Thank it's like you. McCartney singing yesterday. I know, right? It's I, like, I just want to do the cover. I can't, I can't do the cover. I would be happy to read it. This is Good Bones. Life is short, though I keep this from my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. A thousand deliciously ill-advised ways I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there is a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake. Life is short, and the world is at least half terrible. And for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you, though I keep this from my children. I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real shithole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So if I show up on your doorstep with tinfoil over a plate of cake, will you let me in? I will absolutely let you in. (laughs) (laughs) Even if you're wearing a Michigan sweatshirt, I will still let you in. Well, I'm headed up to Michigan later this summer. (laughs) And, you know, Ohio is right on the way. (laughs) Come on down. I actually bake a mean cake. I'll I'll bake for you. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you both. Thank you both. What a lovely conversation. What an incredible conversation. And I feel so honored to have heard Maggie Smith read Good Bones. What I'd like to do now then is read another poem because I believe you should know more than just one of her works of poetry. And this is one that she does include in You Could Make This Place Beautiful. And let me give you the context For the poem, right before she includes this, she says in the book, life, like a poem, is a series of choices. 
Something had shifted, maybe just slightly, but perceptibly. I remember feeling the smile on my face the whole walk back to the hotel, hoping it didn't seem odd to the people around me. I stopped at the drawbridge that lifted so the boats could go under. The whole street lifted up right in front of me. Nothing seemed impossible anymore. Everything was possible. And now here's that poem, Bride. How long have I been wed to myself? Calling myself darling? Dressing for my own pleasure. Each morning, choosing perfume to turn me on. How long have I been alone in this house, but not alone? Married less to the man than to the woman silvering with the mirror. I know the kind of wife I need, and I become her. The one who will leave this earth at the same instant I do. I am my own bride, lifting the veil to see my face. Darling, I say, I have waited for you all my life. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send an email to bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write to Booked Up at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find us. Thank you.